right. Hello, everyone. Um, it's such an honor to be here, as Amber said. My name is Alejandro Alba. I'm a senior correspondent at Now This. I'm also the host of a new show called Can It Save the Planet? And what are we here to do? To save the ocean. I'm going to be spotlighting six different collective ocean actions from around the world. And as you know, this year's theme is revitalizing the ocean. So we're going to have a handful of thought leaders and experts in the field that are going to show us exactly what that looks like. Everything from conservation to restoration and scientific um, exploration and community organization. So let's get started with our first. Uh, we have Sheena Talma up first. She is a marine biologist, educator, and science communicator from the Seychelles. Seychelles, sorry, excuse me. Um, earlier this month, um, she was awarded with the National Geographic Society grant for her deep sea research. And today she is here to show us that research and inspire us to, to make change through the awe-inspiring and mesmerizing uh, biodiversity of the deep sea. So, uh, Sheena. It's a real honor to be here today, and um, I remember feeling extremely nervous before this, and everyone being like, you know what, we're here to share our love for the ocean. So, I hope this evening um, we can all learn from each other. So, my name is Sheena Talma, I'm from the Seychelles, and the Seychelles is a small group of islands in the Indian Ocean. Or as Ambassador Ronnie Jumeau would say, a boss, a big ocean state. So the Seychelles is known for a couple of things. The Coco de Mer, which is the biggest nut in the world, giant tortoises. In fact, their population outnumber the very population of the Seychelles and our beautiful landscapes. We've got granitic mountains and the ocean that surrounds us. So, as many islanders, when you grow up on an island, you spend a lot of time by the sea. And often, it's between zero to about 20 meters, 25 or 30 if you're a diver. And the ocean is important for us as a resource. It's important, that's where we get our food from. That's where we go to on a, after a hard day's work to revitalize. Um, and my relationship with the ocean, um, I am a far cry away from a mermaid, uh, is a little complex. See, when I was a child, I nearly drowned. So that feeling is constantly there every time I go into the ocean. But you can let fear control you, or you can do what you love despite the fear. So in 2019, please play the video. <laughs> Copy, life support systems on and running, hatch secure, uh, safety brief complete, you're clear to dive, 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 dive. This was a joint expedition between Seychelles government and uh, Necton. And this is where I first fell in love with the deep sea. The first time in a submersible, we completely missed that manta ray in the background, by the way. So mesmerized about what was going on around us. But what I remember was that fear dissipating. Remembering that we need to replace the emotions of fear, or the unknown, with new types of experiences. What I loved the most was the serenity. As you go down from 0 to 10, to 20 to 30 to 100 to 300 meters. The way the life forms change, the way it has so much inspiration to inspire the world, to remember what it feels like to be a child, unafraid of the ocean, before all the bad experiences. And after the dive, after about three or four hours, you pop back up to the surface. And at this point, I'm like, right, this is what I want to do with the, re with the rest of my life. I just want to be in the deep sea, whether it's using a submersible or a, a camera, whatever it is. I want to know what lives down there, and I want other people to feel the way I felt when I saw the deep ocean for the first time. Access to deep sea vehicles, access to be able to explore the deep ocean is really difficult, <laughs> um, as documented by many papers. This particular map shows uh, a, a global capacity 
survey that is being performed right now uh, by the Ocean Discovery League, and it shows that a lot of the resources are actually in the northern hemisphere areas with a lot more financing, um, better established scientists, where the capaci capacity to explore deep sea is a lot higher. So how do we change that? We're partnering with the Ocean Discovery League, with Necton and many other organizations to be able to use affordable technology to run our first Seychelles-led um, deep sea research in the Seychelles. A small camera the size of a torch that can go down to about 1,500 meters. And we're very excited about it. So what do I want you to take away from all this? One thing I've learned through the fear is that we need to replace those negative memories with new ones, create new memories with the ocean, relearn our association and the need that we have and that we depend on the ocean for our very own survival. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sheena, for that uh, truly inspiring I want to go on an exploration. Um, our next presenter is Edith Trudith Lukanga. Um, she is joining us virtually. She is the founder and executive director of the Environment Management and Economic Development Organization, also known as Amido. She is going to join us today, as I said, virtually, and she's going to talk about revitalizing collaborations among small scale and artisanal fisheries. And this is in light of 2022 being FAO's International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alejandro, for this beautiful introduction. I'm very pleased to speak to you today in celebration of the United Nations World Oceans Day and to mark the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture. Today, I would like to highlight the important role that women in the fisheries sector play in revitalizing the ocean and their communities. Women are key stakeholders in artisanal and small scale fisheries and their involvement in decision and policy making in these fields is very crucial. However, I have experienced that Women fishers and fish workers often lack a voice in legislative or policy making processes at the global, regional, and national levels. By not including them in decision making, the unique and valuable perspectives of women are lost, and their ideas and interests are not taken into account. To address this issue in Tanzania, I have played a key role in setting up a national organization of women in the fisheries sector, the Tanzania Women Fish Workers Association. We have worked together with the Ministry of Livestock and Fisheries through the national task team for implementation of the voluntary guidelines for securing sustainable small scale fisheries in the context of food security and poverty alleviation shortly known as the Small Scale Fisheries Guidelines. In 2019, a process was started to review the National Fisheries Act. We learned that women voices were not explicitly included in the process. Through my organization, EMEDO, we organized a national workshop that brought together for the very first time in Tanzanian history women from all over Tanzania to share their experiences and their views within the drafting committee, with the drafting committee. And one important suggestion that the women made was to return the 20% of revenues collected from fisheries to be invested in the revitalization of communities and to be used for women's empowerment. So that was very interesting because if the women were not involved in the process, this wouldn't have been brought up. So we then submitted these views to the drafting committee, uh, which 
is um, currently being finalized. The legislation is being finalized. So without our collective efforts, women's voices would not have been included in the drafting process. We are also working with the national organizations of women in fisheries to implement the FAO small scale fisheries guidelines. But we have realized that to have strong collective action at the national level, these efforts need strong support from the grassroots level. And for this reason, we are engaging groups of women from the ground up to building their organizational and institutional capacities so that we are able to, bring, to build a strong base of that national platform at the very local level because we believe in community-driven change. And therefore, when these community groups are empowered, the women are empowered, then their effect will even be realized at the national level. And to conclude, I would like to leave this message that revitalizing the ocean is a collective effort, and women play a central role in this as community leaders, entrepreneurs, and even policymakers. It is thus crucial that the voice of women is heard to ensure a fair, equitable, and sustainable fisheries sector. Through the networks we are developing at the regional, national, uh, continental, and global level, I hope we can act as a role model for coalition building and taking a collaborative approach to ocean governance and revitalization. Thank you again for listening, and I wish you all happy World um, Oceans Day and happy International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture. Thank you so much, Edit Rudith, for uh, showing us how environmental justice and gender equality is important in revitalizing the ocean. Um, up next, we have Kate Orff. She is a landscape architect and founder of SCAPE. She is also a 2017 MacArthur Fellow, and she is joining us here today in person to talk about reviving the New York Harbor and how the healing potential of nature into landscape, architecture, and urban design can help us revitalize the ocean. The floor is yours, Kate. Hi, everyone. I'm Kate Orff. I'm a landscape architect and urban designer. But those words really fall short of how we need to be thinking about our built environment in a way that is inclusive of land and water, and more importantly, designing for life under sea. Some of you may know this woman on the right-hand side of the image. Her name is Rachel Carson. She's doing what probably most of us in this room want to be doing, which is waiting in, uh, looking for uh, small little animals in tide pools. So I was inspired to kind of shift direction from being somebody who's focused really on designing for land and humans to being somebody who is designing a, a, as part of like the land-water continuum, if you will, and really designing for life. Um, Rachel Carson wrote, it is a curious situation that the sea from which life first arose should now be threatened by the activities of one form of that life. But the sea, though changed in a sinister way, will continue to exist. The threat is rather to life itself. I tried to kind of translate these words, and that's an image from my book, Toward an Urban Ecology, into practice uh, in, the, in my firm, Scape. So we've really, really tried to put forward an idea about cultivating community-driven stewardship and pairing forms of regenerative blue-green infrastructure with forms of community life and organizing on shore, moving um, from landscape to seascape to really a stewardship continuum. Here's an image of uh, my project called Oyster Texture that was developed in 2009, in which we were asked to think about New York and its relationship to climate change. But this is really important. Rather than wall ourselves off from the water uh, and build you know, uh, barriers uh, that separate people from water and land and sea because of the threat of sea level rise uh, or, or, and coastal change and coastal storms. This was a vision 
for that continuum, for linking together the city and the watery environs that sustain us. The idea was a community-built and community-developed oyster reef that cleans the water, uh, protects the water, and, and, and adds coastal protection to vulnerable communities on, on shore. We were inspired by the life cycle of the oyster itself in this land-water continuum. Um, and uh, essentially, uh, upland uh, and, and the, the oyster living upland in the Gowanus Canal uh, and moving from larvae to spat on shell to a mature oyster and a developed reef uh, for all its protective benefits uh, kind of showed us the way. Oysters are our engineering partners and our inspiration. So here you can see that vision I'm worried about coastal uh, cities all around the world making the wrong choice and walling themselves off, building barriers between land and sea, between cities and the protective ecosystems such as coral reefs, oyster beds, wetlands, and mangroves that have sustained us, in fact, brought us that urban prosperity. Going in this direction will, as you can see in this model, be also much more fun and more joyful. We derive joy from the, the waters that sustain us as well. In the years after 2009, we developed this project in a number of different ways, through um, oyster gardening with the Billion Oyster Project, through testing, through um, understanding in models uh, and uh, computer models and in physical models, understanding the oyster reef's eff efficacy as infrastructure, as urban infrastructure. And uh, we also understood and kept loving uh, the water and the, the life under sea that will, of course, benefit from this re-embracing uh, of our watery environs. And about 10 years ago, what happened in New York? Superstorm Sandy hit our shores. It was incredibly devastating, and we had profound loss of life. It was a wake-up call. But in the wake of Superstorm Sandy, uh, a project based on oyster texture began to emerge and got funded. It's called Living Breakwaters, and we're building it now. Just like oyster texture, Living Breakwaters ties together the risk reduction uh, potential of offshore oyster reefs uh, with rebuilding culture and uh, learning on shore, and also uh, reintroducing that rocky intertidal ecosystem that New York has literally lost. Our oyster reefs went from 25% to zero uh, in, in, in the last decades. We modified this system, we tested it, um, uh, we drew it in multiple forms. Uh, here is a cross-section of the living breakwater showing how it protects uh, and rebuilds uh, the shorelines. Uh, and how it cleans and, and sustains new life in the intertidal landscape. Like any infrastructure project or building project, we have to design it, we have to uh, understand all of its detail. And this one in particular is not just a breakwater that uh, reduces waves and, and, and reduces erosion. It actually rebuilds these critical intertidal ecosystems that, perform, that are essentially the nurseries of life for juvenile fin fish, shellfish, and beyond. This is a cross-section of exactly how I think we need to be designing and planning for the future. It shows this land-water continuum. It shows how people and ecosystems can come together, and we can think about climate risk reduction in a new way, not by walling ourselves off from the environment, but by embracing it and by increasing our perception of risk and rebuilding these critical infra coastal infrastructure systems to help us sustain life and ourselves in the next century. This project emerged from incredibly robust community outreach processes. It has involved uh, um, oyster-based and, and science-based curriculum for school children on shore. It has brought educators to the shoreline, and so students in New York are now integrated, uh, the restoration uh, curriculum is now integrated into their science-based learning. So it's a hands-on restoration, learning by doing approach. The breakwaters are now under construction. This is a picture I took two weeks ago off the shore of Staten Island in Raritan Bay, and you can see the rocky crenellations and the tidal pools that are in between uh, these crenellations. Even with just a couple of months in the water, you can already see this ecosystem rebounding. Nature doesn't need a lot. We just need to provide this, this sort of critical infrastructure or scaffolding, if you will, and allow it to come back. 
So and you can see oysters, shellfish, and finfish already starting to take hold. In a great way too, you can also see the vision coming to life, uh, which with with this friendly and very comfortable seal uh, doing the banana pose uh, and uh, enjoying uh, this protective breakwater. So even though this is just a modest project in one city in the world, um, I think it's a, a roadmap or maybe a window into what cities all over the the globe need to do. To invest in our blue-green infrastructure, to sustain and invest in uh, the natural ecosystems and the natural infrastructure that has sustained and built us, uh, built, enabled our economies to thrive. So, to close, uh, the Earth is both a physical setting and a decision-making commons that must be cultivated. Um, coastal communities that invest in, engage with, and yes, love their intertidal landscapes are at the heart of making our way in a climate-changed world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, I'm working on an episode actually about uh, coastal cities and harbor, so I'm so excited to, to work uh, with her organization on this. Um, our next presenters, we're going remote. We're gonna meet Martin Kramp and Lisa Blair. They are gonna share a unique collaboration between scientists and sailors and how they're enhancing ocean observation and through that uh, deepen our understanding of the sea. Martin Kramp is a ship coordinator at Ocean OPS, which plays a key role in the global ocean observing system. And Lisa Blair is a multi-world record holding sailor who last week, just last week, broke the world record for solo circumnavigating Antarctica. Uh, she actually just stepped off the boat to tell her story. Uh, thank you, Alejandro. So I'm 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 Martin Crump. I'm ship coordinator uh, at Ocean Ops, which is a, a center uh, in France, jointly run by the World Meteorological Organization and UNESCO's Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission for monitoring and implementation support of the global ocean observing system, uh, observing the ocean from the atmosphere to the seabed. That means use a variety of instruments uh, like. Uh, Ships, of course, research ships or voluntary observing ships, uh, drifting instruments like like uh, an Argo float, which dives into the into the ocean to measure up to two thousand or even six thousand meters, a set of parameters, or surface buoys, uh, which gather atmospheric pressure, which we need for. Um, weather forecasts, for example, it's actually a quite complex system, which you see here on this map at the moment with around probably 8,000 units or so. Uh, international cooperation is here really, really important. Different nations, different systems, different networks, which work together uh, under the umbrella of the United Nations here. And um, to, to get into some of the areas of the ocean, we need assistance from, from, from sailors because they are the only people who go there sometimes. And uh, we are very happy to have Lisa Blair here with us today, uh, who just achieved an amazing uh, world record. So Lisa, thank you very much to contribute here to, to World Ocean Day today. And uh, why don't you introduce yourself a bit and speak about uh, the record? Yeah, thanks, Martin. Hi, everybody. Um, happy World Ocean Day. Uh, I think the event is just brilliant. Um, yeah, so I've just come straight off the boat from the Southern Ocean uh, after spending over 92 days at sea sailing solo, nonstop and unassisted around Antarctica um, for a speed record. So um, I was racing aboard my boat called Climate Action Now and out sea, uh, given that I'm so remote in the Southern Ocean and I'm in that big storm belt that rolls around Antarctica, I basically put my hand up to the scientific community uh, globally and just sort of said, what can I do and what's going to be of value to our scientific communities? And, um, and we got in touch, Martin, then uh, in regards to the Ocean Ops Odyssey program, which is this um, sort of citizen science branch of the Ocean Ops. And uh, so for, for me out there in the Southern Ocean, I was able to deploy um, eight weather drifter boys, um, one Argo research float, I have a subsea research pack on board the boat, which is like a micro lab, and it takes data sets and measures ocean health the entire way around Antarctica 24-7. So 
That's taking data sets like acidity levels, salinity levels, uh, PCO2, uh, chlorophyll, and it's giving us that indication of how's the Southern Ocean processing carbon and, and is it a healthy ocean or not. Um, I was able to collect over 180 microplastic samples while I was out there as well. So, um, you know, for me, uh, being a solo sailor in the Southern Ocean, to be able to have an actual marked impact on our community of scientists and, and giving us a better understanding of our ocean health, especially being that it's the United Nations um, decade of ocean science uh, is incredibly rewarding. And, and I think an incredibly valuable asset is um, these sailors and sailors like myself that are heading down into the Southern Ocean and into these really remote regions uh, to be able to collect data on behalf of our scientists. Um, so satellites cannot look into the ocean. The number of research ships is very limited. We have around 2000 or so voluntary observing ships, uh, um, but they are mostly container vessels. And um, so they only operate close to the main shipping lines. And of these lines, we have uh, very limited means to, to collect data. And, and this is why it is so important to work with, with people like uh, you, Lisa, or with other ocean racers. Uh, to, to get data from these areas and to deploy uh, autonomous instruments in these areas. And if I look here at, at the monthly maps from, from March and April, it's just like there is Lisa Blair and there's the rest of the world, or there's the rest of the world <laughs> and there's Lisa Blair because you, the trek you, you, you made around Antarctica is just so amazing and you brought home such an incredible, important data set. So thank you so much for that. Yeah, thanks, Martin. Um, you know, it's just so amazing for me as a sailor as well to be able to have a visual, a visual result on, um, you know, an impact on our scientific communities from this area. And uh, I think moving forward, it's going to be amazing to see a lot more interaction between ocean sailors and science and, and, and using that platform to collect more data. Uh, Lisa, sailing that uh, raises a lot of uh, attention, can help us to raise awareness for, for, for issues around the ocean. Um, there are things like race villages before a race or so. Uh, how do you believe that um, the role of ocean racing also as an um, educational driver and for raising awareness uh, should and could play a better role in the future? Yeah, I mean, moving forward as sailors, we become, I guess, public figures to some degree through the media coverage that's generated on a record or, or while we're doing a race around the world. And um, to be able to utilise that platform to create positive conversation and deliver education um, to our communities uh, around that message of um, ocean health and, and climate action now and, and our environments is, is just so impactful and, and important. And um, personally, it's so rewarding to know that um, I'm able to have that impact as I go forward. So I'd love to see a lot more of it in that professional ocean racing um, category. And, and as sailors, we see firsthand the devastating effects on our environment out there in the Southern Ocean and out there in the middle of um, these campaigns. So uh, I know for me, in, in one moment in time, I saw a styrofoam box floating past with a bird sitting on it in the middle of the Southern Ocean, and it, and it hits home straight away how important that data is and that research is and, and that awareness that we can deliver. Lila, thank you so much. Uh, that was really so inspiring to follow you uh, on your trip uh, and have a good World Ocean Day. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Happy World Ocean Day. Thank you so much, Martin and Lisa. I can already see it, kind of Ocean Racers, a documentary or like a biopic, uh, nominated for an Oscar or something. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, but thank you so much for showing us the value of this important data. It's, it's truly impressive. Uh, 92 days at sea, I can't even imagine. Our next uh, presenter is Shinobu Namae. He is a head chef at Lefervescence in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, since he opened the restaurant, the restaurant has gained uh, three Michelin stars. And he is here today to tell us how he uses his platform in the culinary word, world to talk about sustainability and how our diets impact the health of the ocean. Thank you, Alessandro. Okay, um, today I would like to talk about seaweed. Seaweeds are multifunctional. 
and for the land is being supplying food uh, for humans and livestock and being used in the medical and cosmetic industry and being used as a fertilizer uh, for a long time in history. In the ocean, it provides natural habitat to support marine life and maintains biological diversity. For the planet as a whole, scientific findings are showing us that not only mangroves, salt marshes, and other coastal wetlands, but also algae and seagrasses, macroalgae, absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, namely blue carbon. Sea desertification has become a common problem in Japan, which severely affects the health of uh, coastal water and damages the local economy. As I wanted to observe what was happening with my own eyes, and I trained to be a freediver and moved to the place where I'm able to observe whatever the ocean, whenever the ocean allows. Scientists have already proved that the seawater temperature is one of the main factors affecting the distribution of seaweed. Higher temperature most probably affect its survival, growth, and reproduction. Moreover, uh, warmer water enables the predator of seaweed, for example, the sea urchin, to be active through the coldest period winter, which is the crucial time for specific uh, seaweed to mature. The winter of 2021, last year, was very warm. Local, warm, uh, local water temperature was quite high. It didn't below, uh, drop below uh, 18 degrees Celsius very often. As a result, the harvest of wild and farmed uh, algae, called wakame, was devastatingly small, and many fishes suffered. This year, thanks to the La Niña, the harvest of winter 2022 turned out to be a big success, and I could see the smile of relief on fish's faces. Actually, my face, I mean, smile is much bigger than <laughs> fish's faces. <laughs> Anyways. Um, <laughs> it is not always comfortable for me to dive into the, the 14 or 50 degrees Celsius water in my wetsuits, but it's amazing to observe the comeback of the seaweed forest. Plunging my head into them and feeling free from gravity, that takes my stress away as if I were an ocean mammal. While the future impact of global warming remains uncertain, these feelings that you may feel in the seaweed forest will heal you and revitalize you. Revitalization of seaweed forest and global warming cannot be considered separately. So, through my cooking, I hope to spark people's awareness and start the discussion about its importance over delicious dishes with various seaweeds. One of the joys of being a chef is to go outside of the kitchen and make someone's day more meaningful and memorable with delicious food. In Japan, uh, people have been eating seaweed for over a thousand years, and cooking seaweed gives us an uh, endless possibility of pleasures. I was recently a part of the seaweed educational workshop with a phycologist and professional diver and the local fisher in a local community for kids. The event consisted of a morning dive in the coastal waters, followed by a lecture by a phycologist and talk by a fisherwoman, and along with my seaweed-themed dishes. Through the event, we are able to provide a physical and intellectual connection with the unseen beautiful seaweed forest, backed up by the world. In my role as a chef, I'm able to serve as a connection between producers and consumers in the food system, to use my platform for storytelling and education so that guests understand where their food is coming from. Through this seaweed project, 
we are establishing the local uh, supply chains and bringing people closer to the environment they live in. I hope that by creating new recipe that honor the unique nature of seaweed, we can connect people's consciousness and invite them to embrace a common goal towards ocean revitalization. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that. Now I'm hungry. Um, that looked delicious. Um, all right, so we have come to our last, uh, but not least, uh, presenter, uh, James Cairo. He is a Pew Fellow and Chief Scientist at the Kenya Marine and Fisheries Research Institute. He is also a member of the International Scientific Working Group on Blue Carbon and served as a coordinating lead author of the IPCC Special Report on Oceans and Cryosphere. Uh, he'll be joining us virtually to share the potential of coastal and marine ecosystems to offer nature-based solutions for blue carbon capture. Thank you, Alejandro, for the introduction. I am going to talk today about the nature-based solution for blue carbon capture. But it is important we understand what's blue carbon. Blue carbon is nothing than the carbon stored, captured and stored by coastal and marine ecosystems, particularly mangroves, tidal marshes, and seagrass beds. These ecosystems capture and store more carbon per unit area than the, than the terrestrial forest. And it's for this reason that they are being recognized for their potential role in climate change mitigation and adaptation. But in addition to climate benefit, Brook carbon ecosystem also provide essential core benefits, such as food security for many coastal communities and biodiversity conservation. We know mangroves are a home for fish. Mangroves protect shoreline. So as a home for fish, they are the feeding ground and their breeding areas. So when you protect mangroves, you'll have increased productivity of marine area, and that's what will contribute to food security. At the same time, when you have healthy ecosystems like mangrove, you'll be protecting the shoreline when, to the, when in the incidences of uh, uh, tsunamis, for instance. Unfortunately, throughout the world, blue carbon ecosystems are being lost and degraded at an alarming rate of 1 to 7% per, per annum, which is significantly higher than any natural ecosystem. What is also worrying is that when blue carbon ecosystems are degraded or their areas is converted for other land uses, the core, the core benefits that we receive from mangroves and the other uh, blue carbon ecosystem are lost to humanity, along with their capacity to store carbon. So in, in essence, they become a net emitter than the net sink. So concerted effort is needed to restore and protect brook carbon ecosystem in order that they continue to play their role as long-term carbon benefits. Many countries have included carbon ecosystem, brook carbon ecosystem in their national climate change mitigation and adaptation strategies, including the nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement. I want to talk specific to Kenya, what we are doing. We are following, we are doing an incentive, we are uh, doing an incentive scheme whereby we are rewarding the communities that are involved in blue carbon uh, conservation under the principles of payment for ecosystem services. And one way we are doing for mangrove, for instance, under the project Miko Copamoya, we are able to restore and protect mangrove through the carbon credits. Uh, each year, the community in Kenya at Vanga and Gazi Bay, they are selling one of 3,000 tons of CO2 in the, to the international market and getting direct income that is able to propel their local development projects, like water and sanitation. We are able to use carbon credits to finance education, 
to finance health, to even to plant more mangrove. We believe that such a scheme, if promoted and expanded, is able to protect and restore this critical ecosystem, the blue carbon ecosystem all over the world. Thank you.